Wow, I have been busy. Not for nothing, though it is about time to catch up on some project videos. Right away, I got a laser. And I see your Schwartz is as big as mine. Even bigger. And today we'll put it to some good use as we assemble this acoustic puzzle. We begin with a box, and looking in it becomes immediately apparent that before we get to laser anything we have somewhat of a kit to assemble. Four extruded aluminum beams make up the frame and are joined with a set of these lock screw connectors. A single M5 screw pulls each corner into a proper right angle alignment and then a couple of these T-slotted nuts go into the outer channels for the X-axis. Once the final beam is attached, we can tighten the lock screws. And now the frame is ready for the gantry, which pulls itself along with a pair of timing belts. The first one threads through one of the base anchors and attaches like so. It then continues under a roller, over a gear, under another roller, and terminates the same way it started. The other timing belt installs in pretty much the same fashion, but instead of a base anchor, it terminates at a switch plate for the Y-axis end stop. The last corner is reserved for the brain box an M5 screw over here, another one over here, and now it's time to flip the whole thing over to install some brackets for the drag chain followed by, of course, the drag chain itself. The last item of note is the laser, and it attaches by way of this dove tail mount vaguely reminiscent of an Arca Swiss quick release plate. Finally, we tend to the harnesses, some grounding provisions, and at last it lives, so let me just get it moving a bit. This is the Laser Master 2 Pro from Orter, a brand that in the past couple of years has become all but synonymous with a variety of hobbyist grade CNC laser gadgetry. This latest offering spans an engraving area of 400 by 400 millimeters, features 32-bit motor control, and a 5.5 watt fixed focus laser with a 12-bit pulse width controller, making it possible to vary the output by as little as one-tenth of one percent. In other words, smooth gradients. The operating software can be just about anything capable of streaming G-code over USB. Here I'm using Laser Gerbil, spelled G-R-B-L, which by the way is a type of firmware written for the Arduino controller. This particular streamer lets you generate a toolpath from an ordinary bitmap, which is handy for engraving photos and such like, but it can also read a vector graphics file, which, broadly speaking, is a toolpath. So you can literally just fire up some CAD software, lay down some geometry, and have the laser follow it with, well, laser-like precision. In fact, this is where I see the potential for the machine to earn its keep, as I'm not particularly interested in decorating flat surfaces with burn marks when I could be making parts for things that come together to make bigger things. I just need to find some material to experiment with, and this sheet of quarter-inch plywood looks about right. Here, I'd like to point out that for woodworking, you might do well to consider a CO2 rather than a solid-state laser. This one, however, can focus a beam onto a spot one-fourth the size of your typical diode-driven unit, which, at 5.5 watts, should cut through a quarter inch of wood without much ado. It's just a matter of dialing in the optimal combination of speed and power. For the cleanest burn, I found that around 8 passes at 250 millimeters per minute with the laser wide open is pretty much where it's at for the plywood, and as you can see the machine doesn't skimp on the detail. Just to give you some idea, the smallest circle you see here is only 2 millimeters in diameter, so yeah, try doing that with a router. Anyhow, let's put this to some actual use. Here we have a pair of these 2.5 inch extended range drivers from Dayton Audio, and here's an enclosure that I designed for today's project. Taking after a trapezoid, it is a 32 piece, 14 layer puzzle which stacks to form the compression chamber, the acoustic waveguide, and a couple of insets for the perpendicular cuts. One of them along the back, serving as a terminal plate for the binding posts, and another one along the front which is where the driver loads into the compression chamber. When all is said and done, this miniature should play near flat between 100Hz and about 20kHz, which in and of itself shouldn't raise any eyebrows, that's what the drivers are rated for, but I'll give you a hint as to the clever bit. Here we have the excursion profile of the driver loaded into the puzzle box, and just for comparison, here it is loaded into a sealed enclosure of the same external dimensions. So hold that thought and we'll come back to it later. For now, let's just get into some laser action. 
here I have the plywood resting on a sheet of galvanized steel which protects the table and makes it possible to clamp things down with magnets. What's more, as I am able to control this thing with simple vectors, I also made a reusable line break for impromptu straight cuts like this. Super handy, especially in the absence of a traditional wood shop. Given adequate ventilation, you could literally do this at your desk. Later, once all the pieces are cut, we can start getting the puzzle together and this is just a casual glue and clamp type operation. You'll notice that I haven't sanded or otherwise treated any of the cuts merely to illustrate what can be done with the laser and the laser alone. So we press on until we come to layer 8, which brings us just past the halfway point. This is where I run the speaker wire with hot glue as my preferred adhesive. From there it's pretty much the same story until the last couple of layers where the ratchet bars replace all but the largest of my clamps. And once the final layer is in place, all that remains is to attach the binding posts, trim the leads, wire them in, glue in the terminal plate, and do the same for the mounting ring along the front. The last thing to go in is the driver, and thankfully these little Daytons come with a nice foam gasket to ensure a good seal without the need for blue tack. Anyway, there it is. Obviously not my cleanest build, but it does prove a concept, namely that you can use a 5.5 watt laser engraver for what I would loosely refer to as woodworking. And if I can manage this on my first try, well, the possibilities are only bound to expand with practice. For now, let's just see if the acoustics hold up. Here comes a sweep. Sorry, here we go. And we appear to be just about on point. What's more, for an enclosure with a driver the size of a jimmy cap, this thing has a fair bit of warm presence. It's not bassy per se, rather punchy and quite lively. However, coming back to the clever bit, rather than expanding the response, the waveguide is set up to oppose the flow of pressure down to around 60Hz, more so than a sealed chamber in fact acting like a pneumatic brake on the driver. So, instead of bottoming out, as we turn up the bass, the excursion remains linear with most of the acoustic energy radiating through the waveguide. Ordinarily, this boost would be dialed in with a DSP, but as it is only a proof of concept, I'll make do with the bass knob. And now, it plays down to about 65Hz. There will be a sound demo at the very end, though in the meantime let's wrap things up with the engraver. This is a keeper. Granted, I don't necessarily care about engraving, but as a light-duty laser cutter, it brings indispensable functionality to the maker workspace. At least, assuming that your process involves cutting shapes out of things because f scissors. Besides, with the laser covering upwards of 16 centimeters per second, you get both speed and precision. And laser. Anyhow, before I sign off, you might have noticed the footage showing a pair of drivers, yet I've only assembled one enclosure. Well, the other one will be different enough to warrant its own video, but in the meantime, thank you for watching this one. If you found anything noteworthy about the voiceover, it's been recorded on the AUHD 300T from Maono, and it's actually giving my Audio Technica AT2035 a run for its money, and this is dynamic versus condenser. Either way, be sure to drop a comment down below. I'm always interested to know what audio gear you play these episodes through. Don't forget to rate the video as you see fit, subscribe if you're so inclined, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers, and enjoy the demo.